Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. This is my sixth annual lecture. Um, going back to the very first one, uh, I talked about a, a concept which um, I later described as the social aspiration gap, excuse the jargon. And what I meant by that was uh, the gap which exists between the kind of aspirations we have for the kind of society we want to live in and the trajectory on which current behavior, current attitudes places us. And that gap is why it is, I think, that even though, despite the recession, austerity, uh, we are a rich country. We are a country with many, many privileges and advantages, but yet it feels as though um, we've almost lost hope in our ability to solve complex problems, problems like inequality and exclusion, like how do we have high quality but affordable public services? How do we provide dignity and care for an aging population? How do we tackle long-term unemployment up yet again uh, today? How do we modernize our infrastructure? How do we have a sustainable economy? Big complex issues where we don't really disagree. We all want, most of us want to solve these problems, but yet we don't seem to be able to. And I want today to look at how it is we span that social aspiration gap. And I, and I want to argue that the bridge that we need to build to span that gap uh, has got three core materials in it. And that's really the focus of my speech today. And before I tell you more, I want to do something which every single speaker in the country is doing right now. And you're going to get heartily sick of it very, very soon, I can assure you. And that is talk about the Olympics. Um, <laughs> so uh, we are going to hear everybody laying claim to the Olympic legacy over the next few weeks. Um, but I want to explain briefly why I think the Olympics was amazing. Because it was amazing. It was transformative. Uh, people who had no interest in sport were suddenly experts on slalom, canoe, and dressage. And people like me, who are a little bit diffident about waving Union Jacks in the air, were buying Union Jack t-shirts and suits. So uh, it was an amazing thing. And I think it was amazing because um, of this. Firstly, it was brilliantly organized. Now, we'd kind of almost forgotten that we could do something like that. You know, the stadiums were built and the transport worked and everyone thought something would go wrong and nothing did. Secondly, the whole country got behind it. It mobilized everybody. We were all enthusiastic. And I think everybody agrees that the most amazing thing was the volunteer army. That was the thing we were most proud of. And then thirdly, what is at the centerpiece of the Olympics? The heart of it and that is amazing individuals and their efforts and their achievements. So that's why I think the Olympics were special, that combination. Because that goes to what I want to argue tonight are the three fundamental sources of social power. In fact, I think, but that's for a different lecture, that they are uh, the three fundamental characteristics of us as a social species. Uh, and these three sources of social power are hierarchical authority, social solidarity, and individual aspiration. So let me explain a bit more. What do I mean by hierarchical authority? In essence, what I mean is all those people who have the right or think they have the right to tell us what to do. Uh, so uh, politicians, chief executives, experts, strategists. Uh, that's what I mean by hierarchical authority. By social solidarity, I mean the things that we do because we're part of a group of people with whom we feel we share values and responsibilities. And by individual aspiration, I just mean our will to survive and to uh, succeed. If you like, these are three voices in our heads that we hear when we've got to make a choice. I'll do what I'm told, I'll do what everyone else is doing, I'll do what I want. Uh, now, there is a fourth way of thinking about change. These are all ways of thinking about change and also ways of pursuing change. And there's a fourth way, and which is slightly different, and that's fatalism. That's what we do when we don't think change is possible at all, or if it is possible, it's not going to work for us. Now, to bring this alive a bit more, think of climate change and uh, how this describes the positions people take on climate change. So the hierarchical position is what we need is a new international treaty 
written by scientists and experts and signed off by politicians, which is binding on everybody in the world. Uh, the solidaristic view, which is all about our responsibilities to each other, is that we need to give up eating meat and stop flying in planes and change our whole lifestyle. Uh, the individualistic view, uh, I think well summed up by the phrase, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stone, uh, is that it will be solved through individual ingenuity, through markets, through innovation, through technology. We shouldn't worry so much about it. And the fatalistic view is it's all made up, and if it's not all made up, we're screwed. Now, as those examples uh, suggest, Actually, the way you solve complex problems is to bring all of those perspectives together. Anyone who really wants to tackle climate change will want effective treaties. They will recognize we need to change our lifestyles, and they will want and hope that innovation and technology produces great uh, solutions. But in contrast to the Olympics, the problem with society, I want to argue, is that those sources of social power have become unbalanced. So look first at hierarchy. I don't need to tell you, you'll all have seen the surveys, our trust in leaders, in political leaders, in chief executives, in leaders of all kinds is an all-time low. I think the Edelman Global Survey this year found 38% levels of, the level of trust in leaders was 38%, lowest ever recorded. Now why is it? Why is it that we have lost faith in hierarchical authority? Well, here's a few ideas. First of all, it's failed. Um, 30 years ago, one million unemployed people would have been considered a scandal. Living standards rose year on year. Mo living standards for most people in Britain and America and other countries haven't risen now for about 20 or 30 years. Uh, so the hierarchy hasn't delivered the goods for most people. Also, in the face of growing accountability, often hierarchies have done just the wrong thing, which is to batten down the hatches. Think of the Catholic Church. Think of Fleet Street. Think today of how the police responded to Hillsborough. So disastrous choices by leaders in the face of growing public accountability, demands for accountability. But also, there's just been change in society. We are a much less deferential pe group of people than we used to be. We have higher and more differentiated expectations. And just when hierarchy thought things couldn't get any worse, along comes technology. And technology, which used to be something which strengthened the hierarchy, is now something which empowers the individual. You know, it used to be that you could only have a big computer if you were a big company. Now all of you have got more computing power in your pocket than IBM had 40 years ago. Uh, and so the individual can get access to information. And as companies know when they suffer Twitter attacks, uh, people can mobilise very, very quickly against hierarchies they don't think are doing the right thing. So hierarchy is enfeebled. What about social solidarity? Well, also we, find, we know that levels of trust in strangers now is lower than it has ever been uh, before. And... There's also been the decline of what sociologists call congregational institutions. Those are institutions which people bind people together, that people spend a lot of time in, which aren't just about pursuing a single issue, but are about a shared set of values in which people negotiate and work together, things like political parties, trade unions, the organised uh, church. So why has this happened? Well, uh, I think social diversity, which is a great thing in many ways, has been uh, partly implicated, and mobility, which is also a great thing. For 190,000 years, we evolved to trust people like ourselves. And now we have to trust and get on with people who are very different from ourselves, who live in our street, who live next door to us. Also, we've seen the fracturing of class. Many of those solidaristic institutions are based on class. But we've seen the fracturing of the working class so that we have a more affluent, aspirational working class trying to cling on to its respectability. And then we have a disadvantaged group concentrated in social housing. Think of anyone who's old enough like me to remember that council housing used to be a tenure of choice. Now it's just a tenure uh, for people who've got no choice and got no job, generally speaking. And we've also seen a fracturing of the middle class into those, again, tenaciously trying to hold on to the middle class status and the super rich who fly around the world as global uh, citizens. And then finally, what about individualism? Well, individualism is what it is. It's got strengths and weaknesses. And the main problem with individualism in the modern world, actually, is the decline of hierarchy and solidarity. It's created a vacuum, and individualism has come into that vacuum, and it's kind of overburdened. But it's also the case uh, that individualism has become narrow and materialistic, and there are particular reasons for that. There's the 
The myth from neoclassical economics, the myth of homo economicus, that we're all perfectly informed, utility-maximizing individuals. Now, that, of course, has been a theory which was already a bit ludicrous, has been blown out of the water pretty much by uh, the credit crunch. I don't know, Alan Greenspan, one of the greatest understatements of all time, was asked immediately after collapse of the lane what he thought of that theory, and he said, well, I think he said maybe uh, there's a flaw in the theory, he argued. Um, so we had that, um, that ideology. Uh, of course, we've also got the propaganda of consumerism. You know, as you walk home tonight, there'll be lots of consumer messages to tell you that being a kind of materialistic individual is great because, because you're worth it. Um, and also, this is just because this is how the world feels to us. We know from all sorts of experiments that we systematically exaggerate the degrees to which what we do and who we are is the result of our individual choices, and we systematically underestimate the degree to which who we are and what we do is a consequence of the social context in which we uh, operate. So, uh, this is my argument, that we live in a society where uh, hierarchy is enfeebled, social solidarity is weakened, and individualism ha is overburdened, and it's a narrow form of individualism. Now, what is the consequence of that? Well, I think there are two consequences of that. One, which I've already referred to, and the first consequence is that we're just not developing the kinds of solutions that mobilize all those forms of social power. One example I'd give is, why is it in the face of inequality in society that the answer every politician seems to agree on is social mobility? The idea that picking a few talented individuals out of poor communities and progressing them, even if we could do it, and we don't seem to know how to do it, the idea that it would actually concentrate disadvantage in, poorest, in the poorest community does nothing about the overall levels of justice and inclusion in society. It seems like the only response people can have to a big social problem like injustice is a highly individualistic response. Let's find some individuals and, and, and save them. Um, but looking at it from other angles, you can see also that narrowness. Um, a few weeks ago, there was a report on old people in hospital, which found that old people in hospital were very often in very squalid conditions. Their bed was wet, they were hungry, um, uh, they were in a terrible way. Now, the conclusion to that report, because we tend to look at things through a hierarchical lens very often when it's the state involved, was it's the fault of managers, it was the fault of nurses. In fact, someone made the suggestion, which seemed to be a bit ludicrous, that we should teach nurses compassion. This is obviously the problem. Now, my response to that story was this. I have seen people at the end of their lives, and I've seen people in those situations of dependency, and I can tell you what the critical variable is for how they're treated. The critical variable is whether they have loved ones visiting them. So actually, uh, whilst there might have been a managerial failure and a nursing failure, it's also the f a failure of the social isolation of older people. The solution may be to teach nurses compassion and get better managers. The best solution, actually, is that we don't have so many older people who are in hospitals and in homes on their own with nobody to argue for them and communicate them and spend time with them. So this is a much broader question of social responsibility in response to ageing people. But let's have a neat solution. Let's just blame it on the managers and nurses. And I've seen this time and again. You know, Labour committed to abolishing child poverty. It's a great and noble aim. It should have been something that mobilised the whole country and where we thought about how it is we could inspire the individual aspirations of poor families. Instead, it became something which the Treasury did to people through clever tax credits, through technocratic solutions. David Cameron argued for the big society. I love the idea of the big society. It's a strong notion of solidarity, renewing solidarity. David Cameron recognised this. The problem is he had no account of why individuals would want to suddenly start volunteering, and he totally failed to get Whitehall behind this idea. So it just remained as a kind of pious notion floating around. So the first consequence of us not mobilizing individualism, hierarchy, and solidarity together is we come up with feeble solutions to big problems. And when you watch the politicians speak at party conference, what you'll see is you'll see high-flown rhetoric about values and then little tiny solutions, and you'll wonder, what, why is there such this huge imbalance between these values and these little tiny ideas that they've got? I'm offering you a solution, uh, an explanation for that. But there's something else that's happened. There's another consequence of this imbalance. And when I was re researching this speech, I came across an amazing speech given by Jimmy Carter, the American president, in 1979. Um, and I, I just want to play you uh, a few seconds um, of that speech. It's clear that the true problems of our nation are much deeper, deeper, than gasoline lines or energy shortages, deeper even than inflation or recession. So I want to speak to you first tonight about a subject even more serious than energy or inflation. I want to talk to you right now 
about a fundamental threat to American democracy. The threat is nearly invisible in ordinary ways. It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. We can see this crisis in the growing doubt about the meaning of our own lives and in the loss of a unity of purpose for our nation. Now, about four days after that, the White House collapsed, and a year after that, Jimmy Carter lost power. So uh, you can see why politicians have not found that a very um, a message they want to copy. But what Jimmy Carter was incredibly brave, it's a brilliant speech, by the way, it was worth watching all of it. Uh, and in fact, the public reaction immediately after it was quite good, but, but Carter's problems are much more fundamental politically. But what Carter was identifying for the first time was that American people did not believe the future would be better than the past, and he thought that was a remarkable and frightening thing. Ever since then, although there have been cycles, that social pessimism has deepened. And what polls find again and again is this, that individually we tend to exaggerate our prospects. I'm afraid none of you are going to do quite as well as you think you're going to do. Um, <laughs> but socially, we, we are deeply pessimistic. We think the world is worse than it is, and we don't think it's going to get... Uh, any better. And this social pessimism, which I believe is a reflection of some of the forces I'm talking about, that unbalancing, uh, is in danger of becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, okay, lots of big ideas, but what, what are the implications of this? Does it have any kind of, is there anything we can do about it practically? Well, I, I want to uh, suggest three, uh, and the first is itself quite abstract, but it, it matters to me because I uh, I was trained as a sociologist, if that's not a contradiction in terms. So um, <laughs> the first point I want to make is that I think we should try and think about society as a whole. It's kind of gone out of fashion. When I was at university, th there were theorists who tried to think about society as a whole, as a functioning whole. And that, as I say, it's gone out of fashion, but I think we should, we should do that. We should try to understand society as a whole. And part of the reason that that went out of fashion is that it was associated with a school of thought called functionalism, which said that society does function as a unit and it all fits together. And, and that theory was discredited partly because people said, well, what about conflict and what about complexity? It's all too neat. Now, I want to suggest that, that, that my account enables us to bring together a view of society with complexity and with conflict. Because not only is it the case that we need solutions which combine individualism, hierarchical authority and solidarity, but the fascinating thing is these solutions will never be very stable, and the reason for that is because all of these perspectives hate each other. There is a fundamental conflict between these different ways of viewing the world. So just as we try and push them together, they will always be jostling with each other. In fact, they get their energy from their opposition to each other. You know, hierarchies get their energy from the fact they've got to control the risk-taking individualists and the backward-looking people organizing the demo or whatever. Uh, people uh, in solidaristic organizations are always against the hierarchy, and again, they're threatened by individualism. I, I saw a great example uh, of this a few weeks ago, going from the Grand to the very uh, parochial, a few months ago. I was at a, an underground station, and people were queuing up because the trains were delayed. And so we're all standing in the queue. So this queue was a combination of two of the things I've described to you, hierarchy, but also that fatalism I discussed. We were standing in the queue because we were told to stand in the queue. The orders were to stand in the queue, and we were standing in the queue because everything bloody well goes wrong and I'm never on time for work, right? That was the boot. Then what happened was a few people, they might have been in a hurry, they might have been megalomaniacs, I don't know, but they realized that you could duck under the barrier and you could walk up the exit and get to the front of the queue. So a few people did this. And what was interesting was the queue changed its, its form we started murmuring to each other. And we stopped being just a hierarchical queue, and we became a solidaristic queue. We were a queue defined by the fact that we subscribed to the values of queuing, <laughs> as distinct from these horrible individualists who were doing their own thing. So uh, I, I want to argue that we can think about society as a whole, and we can understand how it functions, and we can recognize the need for these three forces to be held together, whilst recognizing that they're also kind of centrifugal forces, which mean that they're always fighting each other, and that solutions are never fully stable. The, the second implication, of course, is that we have to think about how it is we renew and reshape the forces of power that I've described. And, and I could do, uh, I could give a speech about each of these, and so I'll just, just be bullet points. But first of all, hierarchy. How might we renew hierarchy? Well, I think, first of all, we need leaders who tell it how it is. Uh, and I don't think we have that at the moment. Barack Obama, 
last week. He, he is one of the leaders who's most consistently done this. He said in his speech last week, don't look to me for change. In the end, change depends upon you. And uh, all I can do is what you choose to do. Of course, it's not a new message. Kennedy said the same thing 50 years uh, before him. But we need leaders who kind of tell us the truth about how little power they have got unless they can engage us in the process of change that they're describing. Uh, secondly, I think we need leaders who are both, on the one hand, more ambitious about what they want to achieve, inspire us a bit, but at the same time are much more devolved in the way in which they try and make change happen. Uh, I think at the moment we have leaders who are controlling but not very ambitious, so it's the reverse of that. It's interesting, we had Richard Florida in this room on Monday, who's a great expert on cities, and we were just talking about why is it that city leaders around the world are so much more popular than national leaders. And it's because they're closer to the people. So we need great ambition, but we need to understand that solutions increasingly need to be local and engage people at a local level. And then thirdly, we need a new ethic of leadership, whether it's Royal Bank of Scotland or MPs or whatever it is, we need a new ethic of leadership. And for me, this is fundamentally about reflexivity. It's about leaders who think about leadership and are aware of the perils of leadership and who welcome accountability because they know that being a leader is a dangerous thing. Secondly, how do we renew solidarity? Well, first of all, I'm fascinated by the work that's going on right now as we deepen empathy. There's a wonderful project, many of you will have heard of it, called Roots of Empathy, which takes very small babies into classrooms and children play with them, and it seems to have a powerful impact on their capacity of empathy. So we have to understand how it is we encourage empathy, because for me, in the 21st century, the ability to trust and get on with people different to yourself is, is a critical 21st century capability, and it's one that we need to explore how we develop in young people. Secondly, we need to understand social networks better. This is something the RSA has made a bit of a specialism. Uh, we are understanding more and more that people's social networks, the social networks which exist in communities, are vital to the resilience of those communities, to the opportunities. And I think the more we understand about social networks, the more we'll be able to use those to bring people together to find uh, solutions. And then thirdly, we've got to try to renew those old institutions that I said are in decline. Uh, and in, actually, there's some good examples. The Scouts, the Women's Institute. I like to think the RSA are examples of old institutions which have taken risks and have become relevant in the modern world. We need the same kind of risk-taking in our political parties, uh, for example. We need to renew those institutions. Then finally, we have to recast individualism. As I said before, I don't think the fundamental problem with individualism is it's not restrained by hierarchy and solidarity. That's its problem. It's, it's hubristic, but we, it is also narrow. And so uh, I'll just give you three names. Aristotle, Dan Gilbert, and Nicola Sarkozy. Um, uh, Aristotle... Uh, because he said things like, should we not say that he is happy whose acts are virtuous and has adequate external goods for his lifetime? So we should learn from Aristotle a slightly deeper and more holistic account of what it is to be a successful individual. You should all read Dan Gilbert's book, Stumbling into Happiness, which I read a few years ago and influenced me enormously, because what Dan Gilbert shows is that we are very, very bad at predicting what's going to make us happy. In fact, we're extremely bad at even describing what made us happy in the past. So that might uh, help us uh, get off the kind of treadmill of thinking that buying a new car and the latest thing is going to make us happy because generally it doesn't. And, and good old Nicholas Sarkozy, he may have lost power, um, but he did set up the commission, uh, a huge commission on exploring kind of well-being and happiness, which has influenced debate around the world. And so maybe out of that, and we're doing it in Britain as well, we will get a richer understanding of the kind of things that make us happy. I often say you can sum up happiness research in one sentence, which is if you want to be uh, happy for uh, a year, um, get married. If you want to be happy for a decade, get a dog. If you want to be happy for the whole of your life, get a garden. Uh, I'm afraid <laughs> that that is basically the evidence. So, um, uh, so maybe these kinds of insights will help us to have a slightly richer kind of idea of what it is to be a successful uh, individual. Uh, and then finally, uh, finally, 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 uh, the third thing I think you get out of this perspective, um, as well as thinking about society as a whole, as well as understanding how we have to renew the sources of social power, is I think it changes the way we think about organizations and problems. Um, I think organizations often suffer from the fact that they don't mobilize those three forms of power. Public service organizations, traditionally, are good at hierarchy and they're good at solidarity. They're not terribly good at individualism. They're not very good at creating environments for risk-taking and enterprise. But when organizations, by the way, have just got one of those forces, they can be very, very dangerous banks. These were institutions with no hierarchical oversight because no one in charge knew what was going on. Absolutely no sense of social responsibility. They were hyper-individualistic cultures. They were bound to go wrong. Unfortunately, we gave them an enormous amount of power. Um, communes, another great example. Communes always fail. 
Um, the only communes that ever survive are ones that have hierarchies. Uh, because solidarity on its own is disastrous, because no one can decide whose turn it is to do the cooking. Um, uh, or look at the Soviet Union. That's another example of a, of a, of a culture that collapsed, because it was overwhelmingly hierarchical. Anyway, the point I'm making is, when we think about organizations, we should think about how it is organizations mobilize those different sources of power, bring them together, recognizing the dynamism. And also, we need this approach to how it is we solve problems. And what that's led me to, it's led me to a, a change in my whole way of thinking since I've been at the RSA. I used to be a policy wonk. And now I increasingly think that policy, the policy frame is not the way to solve problems. The design frame is the way to solve problems. Uh, and so this approach, I think, leads us to think about problems as a designer would, which is to spend more time really understanding the problem and also getting the fact that the problem looks different depending where you're looking at it from. So let me give you an example of a piece of work the RSA is doing and publishing next week. We've been looking at the informal economy. So this is an issue that's been around forever. All these people who don't pay taxes and then they're not in the legitimate economy, they're taking a risk. Uh, and every few years, government tries to do something about it and it achieves absolutely nothing. Now, again, there are three ways that you might tackle the informal economy. Hierarchical ways to have stronger rules, regulation, and enforcement. The solidaristic way is to say, what about the social norms? How many of you have paid cash in hand? You know? Don't we need to make, increase the sense of taboo on people working in the informal economy and paying out in the informal economy? And the individualistic way is, how do we incentivize these individuals to go formal, to go legit? And the reality is you need a solution that combines those things at the same time as recognizing that if you do too much of one, the whole thing will destabilize. So if you give people, individuals, too many incentives, then people who've always been legitimate will say, why are these people getting extra money to go straight when I've always gone straight? Um, and if the hierarchy gets too officious, then the community, which could have been on their side, will turn against them, just like they did with that conservative minister who talked about the informal economy a few weeks ago, and everyone said, why are you talking about window cleaners who should be talking about bankers? Uh, so it's a way of solving problems that looks at them from multiple angles and tries to get to the heart of what the difficulty is. And it also leads to an approach to problem solving, unlike policymakers who try and have a once and for all solution, which is much more incremental and much more flexible, because you recognize that as these ways of solving problems interact with each other, all sorts of unpredictable things happen. So you have to have solutions which enable you rather like someone molding a clay pot to constantly adjust. And that's a huge challenge for how we do policy, but I think that's how we have to make policy to tackle complex problems. So, the Olympics was special. Um, and as I say, over the next few weeks, we will have to endure every political speech seeking to hijack it. Someone told me there is already a website dedicated to, apparently, excuse my language, Olympic bullshit bingo. Um, <laughs> so I've tried to get ahead of the game. Um, I've argued that the lesson we should learn from the Olympics is this. If we combine responsible and trusted authority, shared commitment and mutual support, and the firepower of individual ambition, and we combine them understanding their inherent dynamism and tensions, then whilst we will never host the Olympics again in our lifetimes, we can start to close that social aspiration gap, and we can rekindle our belief in a better future. Thank you.